Before we begin tonight, we're uh, happy to have Brother Scott and his family here. Brother Scott, would you introduce yourself and your family to everyone, please? Very glad to have you with us tonight. <coughs> this will be our 24th lesson in the book of Genesis. We're going to begin the 15th chapter tonight. The Word of God comes to Abram in a vision. If you're young and you wonder why we use the word Abram instead of Abraham, as Abram was renamed and he hasn't been renamed yet. He was renamed to indicate he's going to be a father of many nations. So Abram is his original name. Now we're going to touch on some excellent things tonight, in my judgment at any rate. It's good when the speaker knows it's a wonderful thing, you know, that's, that's a special blessing. We'll be covering the 15th chapter, which is 21 verses. As you know, it, uh, it's not my practice to cover so many verses, but the book of Genesis is a different kind of a book. You know, if you just squat on each verse as you go through, you'll kind of lose your, lose your bearings, what it's all about. So that's why we're doing this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, "Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward." And Abram said, "Lord God." What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. It thought it would, that was how he had arranged things up to this point. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. He said, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age." And in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. 
In that same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Under thy seed I have given this land from the river Euphrates unto the great river, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Now, as you know, as, and I've sought to emphasize this, that the book of Genesis is a book of firsts. Of course, that's what Genesis means, beginning. Through this 15th chapter, there are 168 firsts that happened. Just since the 13th chapter, there's 23 firsts. Did never happen before. I list them here. I won't take the time to read them. Why I say this is that in the book of Genesis, God's just not giving you history. That's what you want. Study American history. That's not what he's giving you. God is acquainting people with himself. You're learning something about God in the book of Genesis. Now, there have been thousands of people, maybe millions of people that read Genesis didn't learn squat about God. They didn't learn anything about God because they, they weren't thinking about God when they read the book of Genesis. They were thinking about the people in Genesis. And so some have come up with some really zany explanations about what was happening in the book of Genesis. But this book is about God. God's showing how he works with people, what he thinks of people, what he gives to people, what he takes some things from some people. The land he gave to Israel, he took it from some other people. Huh? God's acquainting you with himself. Now, no one who takes the book of Genesis seriously would come up with conclusions like these that I'm going to name that the universe evolved over an extremely long period of time. Yeah. No one got that out of the book of Genesis. I don't care. Theistic evolution be hanged. Okay. Nobody yeah. got that out of the book of Genesis. Uh -huh. No one could read the book of Genesis and come up with the conclusion that the beginning of humanity was the result of some natural process. Or that someone created morally perfect and placed in a place by God could never be thrust out of it. Yeah. Now people think they think this of God. Now they think God is this way. Uh -huh. They think that it's possible for you to be, in their language, saved. Mm -hmm. What they mean by that is, and that you somehow are locked into it and nothing can happen to you. And you got in the Bible where God made a garden, God put Adam and Eve in it, and God drove them out. That's in the Bible. So this the idea that God could that God was that kind of God, this is another God. It's not the God of the Bible. You couldn't read the book of Genesis and conclude that God did not care what men wore. Now, we live in an age where people say this. They say, God didn't care what you wear, which was the first issue he had was what they wore. That's the, <laughs> that was the first issue God had with humanity. He didn't like what they wore. Yeah. I'm just saying that if people just read the book of Genesis, it would resolve a lot of, a lot of questions. Or no one could read the book of Genesis and think God was indifferent to those who ignored his word. Even Cain, who happened to be a child of the devil. Yeah. No one could read the book of Genesis and conclude God doesn't insist on obedience. Or that God is not a God of judgment. Or that God does not destroy people. So a tsunami happens, or a tornado, or a hurricane, and something. Well, God didn't do that. Here you got the record of the flood. 
How can you say something like that and overlook the flood? Which looked like a natural disaster, but it was a supernatural disaster that God did. Amen. Well, just about the time you get thinking God doesn't do things like this, just go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. God's telling you about himself here. Or that God cannot protect those that he chooses. Like Noah and his family through that flood. Or that God is not selective. So God didn't choose one person above another, but he doesn't? You got Noah and the rest of them were rejected. You got Seth and the rest of Adam's offspring were rejected. You got Enos and the rest of Seth's prodigy were rejected. You got Abram had eight sons. One of them, one of them was accepted. And in all the history of humanity, Matthew lists 74 men that were picked out of billions of people. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So how can someone read this and say God's not selective? It's according to his judgment, I understand. Or the, how about maybe God doesn't take due note of what unbelievers do, that if they're not in covenant with God. And I come from a background where they taught this. He said, well, the world's not in covenant with God, so God doesn't pay attention to what they do. Well, how do you handle the plain of Shinar? Yeah. Uh -huh. And the scattered of the people of Babel. Those weren't exactly believers, were they? Or Sodom and Gomorrah, they weren't believers, were they? So God does take note of the nations that forget him, and Psalm says he's going to turn them into hell, mm -hmm. even if it's the good old USA. That's right. But people say, well... This is a Christian nation. No, this is not a Christian nation. This is one of the worst nations in the world because of what it's known and what it's been exposed to. Don't think for one moment that God's going to glance over this or that there's some good deed that can compensate for what's went on here. This is all the book of Genesis. See, it's heathen nations were back there. Or that God doesn't scatter people. Like he did at China. Or that God's long suffering is endless. The NIV translates God everlasting mercy. Sounds nice. But you have to explain on the day of judgment to the people in the flood because his mercy ran out and his long suffering stopped. And Jerusalem, his long suffering stopped. So God does have an endurance time, so to speak. Or that God's not affected by what he sees. This is something a lot of people don't know about God. God's affected by what he sees. If he sees wickedness in the earth, it affects him a certain way. If he sees someone who cleaves to him and craves his word, he, it affects him a certain way. And he's, for, he's told you how it affects him, so you kind of know what to... He said, those are humble and contrite spirit, oh, great, great price. God says, I'll look toward this man. I'll fix my eyes on this man that fears me and trembles at my word. I'm going to pay attention to He tells you this. This isn't a matter of conjecture. Or maybe a person might believe that God, uh, God doesn't plague people. Pharaoh's house is plagued because of Sarah. <laughs> See, this is Pharaoh's, what, in Joseph's day, pot, in Joseph's day, there were plagues. There, some people were plagued. His brothers lived in fear and trepidation for a number of years because of this maldeed they did. And, uh, well, God, some people don't think God won't dispossess a land. He won't take a land from one people and give it to another. But he took it from these, he named the nations, there are ten of them. He took it from them. He gave it to Israel. As we're going to see tonight, he tells them why he did it. They defiled the land. Now, mind you, I'm not, I don't like to talk about this subject I'm going to mention here, but it's just something that I have thought about. People have said that the Lord took, that the Americans took the land from the American Indians and so forth and so forth. But when you think of what the American Indians, <laughs> not exactly an example of worshipers of God, I used to have long discussions with an Indian salesman at 
office max. We'd talk for long times. They worship the earth and believe there's certain places of the earth where spirits are, and they go there. And I don't, I don't find it difficult to believe that God took the land from them and gave it to somebody else. And I think He could do the same thing again. This is in the book of Genesis. This kind of thing is made known to us. All right, without further ado, let's get into this. After these things, <laughs> after these things, <laughs> well, there's a lot of things, you know, these things. The latest thing was Abram and 318 of his servants overran and conquered and slaughtered four mighty kings and all their armies that had devastated great areas of that land. Abram and his 318 men defeated them all, slaughtered them. And Hebrews mentions the slaughter, slaughtered them. But now he says, after the, he just kind of passes, after these things, passes over that. Now you learn one thing about God that he doesn't report everything that took place in the Bible or during that time period. He doesn't report everything that took place. Only the things that are pertinent to understanding his work. That's what he reports. You say, well, what, what, so what does that mean? What do you think about when you assess your life? What is it that dominates your memory when you go over your life? Is it things that pertain to God and what he did and you're turning to God? Or are you caught up in all the nitty-gritty, Joe didn't treat me right, my parents didn't treat me right, and all this kind of nonsense? There's people live with this. Because people live with this. Live 40, 50, 60 years hating mommy and daddy because they didn't do everything they thought they should. Yeah. Now you're learning here, this is not the way God thinks. Amen. And it's not the way we should think. You look over things from God's viewpoint. And there'll be large segments of your life. I will speak to this people for myself. There be large. There were large segments of my younger life when I. It's a miracle I got through them. So I could. I couldn't explain to you how I got through it. But I did. And how I so I think of God. Now this puts a whole different life uh, look on my past life. You can think of your past life, and you can end up. My grandmother used to say a case of the mully grubs. Or you can look at your past life and see God working with you, yeah. turning you around, bringing you to this perspective, bringing you to that perspective, working things so you finally got away from a misconception that you had, and so forth. So that's something to learn from the way <coughs> God assesses people in Scripture and reports them. <coughs> Abram is nearly 80 years old at this time. So there's a lot of things that had happened. Just He just started rehearsing the ones from when he left Ur of the Chaldees and went to Haran, and at Haran he's 75. So he's just rehearsing. He wraps up all those incidents, these things. The word of the Lord came to Abram uh, in a vision. This is the first mention of a vision in the Bible. Now to show the uniqueness of this, the next mention of a vision is a word that God delivered to Aaron and Miriam when they criticized him because of who he married. And he said he'd speak to people in a court of vision, but he didn't talk that way to Moses. That's the next time you read the word vision in the Bible, which is a half a, half a millennium later. <laughs> 500 years. So if we don't hear anything more about visions for 500 years. That shows you how unique this, see, that shows you how unique <laughs> this is. What God had said to uh, Aaron and Miriam was, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, will speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. That's an inferior form of revelation. In fact, Jeremiah says dreams are chaff compared to wheat. 
With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid? Why weren't you afraid? This is God talking. Why weren't you afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Miriam, you remember, was stricken with leprosy. As Moses' sister, Moses prayed for her and she was healed. When Moses died, he was rehearsing to Israel some of the closing events of his life. And he, he reminded them that he was at Mount Sinai. He prayed for the people when they danced around the calf. And this sentence is thrown in there. And I prayed for Aaron also, mm -hmm. who made the golden calf. Because yeah. <laughs> I wondered for years about that. I wondered, how did Aaron, why didn't that come up anymore? See, I didn't realize that it was mentioned in Scripture. Yeah. Why are we not afraid to speak against my... If, if I talk to somebody, God says, how dare you criticize them? Well, that's sober you up now. Amen. I've heard people, you've seen some of them, where I've repeated some of the dialogue, have criticized Paul, mm -hmm. said he gave his opinion and so forth. It'd be God to say, how, how dare you? How dare you speak against my servant Paul. Yeah. Or you can even put your name in there. If you trust the Lord, you're living by faith, and someone levels unjust criticism at you, God will, if he doesn't say it in this life, he'll say it the day of judgment. How did you, how did you dare to speak against the person I favored and that I spoke with? So that's the, la that's the next time you read about visions. The point. Now, there are notable people in the Scripture that had visions. I list them here. They're not considering the length of time. It wasn't that many. A period of about 2,100 years. During a period of 2,100 years, roughly 21 people are recorded as having visions. Well, that's, you know, that's one every 100 years. So if someone boasts to you, well, I've been having visions well, really, you, I hope you have had something more than that. That's valid. Mm -hmm. they, there are visions, but they're inferior. They're an inferior form of revelation. People are close to God, the visions, that's not how he... Yeah. Let me tell you something. When, that, when, the God, when it came time to preach the gospel, God didn't reveal the gospel by a vision. Right. When it comes to justification by faith, God didn't reveal that by a vision. When it comes to the coming of the Lord and all the, all of the things that impact around, he didn't reveal that by a vision. Visions generally have to do with things that are occurring on the earth. I'll, I'll leave it there. Not, not good to dwell on that. <coughs> in his vision, he said to Abram, to Abram, in a vision, <coughs> fear not, Abram. Don't be afraid. <coughs> it's the first time in the Bible, fear not, is said. Fear not. Why do you have to say that? Because when man confronts God, man begins to tremble. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be John in the Isle of Patmos. <laughs> it could be Moses on Mount Sinai. Tremble. This is just the way it is. Why? Because God is so superior to flesh that this... It's not, it's not that the person's thinking of anger and this sort of thing. That's, that's not it. It's that there's a vast difference between God and man. Fear not. So, now this fear not, this is not like a commandment like don't lie. This is a commandment like, let there be light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, you got to see that. that <laughs> In this word, there was power that caused that to happen. Yeah. Don't fear. Mm -hmm. That by that, just calm them down. And keep in mind the primitive spiritual nature of the times. Yeah. We're not talking about after Pentecost or something like this. We're talking about spiritually primitive times when very little was known about God. 
And here God appears to Abram in a vision and talks directly to him and calls him by name. Well, what would you do if this happened? Well, if suddenly in your sleep, you became lively, keenly aware that God is talking to you, and he said, Mary. Well, I can tell you, you perk up. Yeah. huh? He said, David. <laughs> He'd have your attention, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. That's the way God is. And it's, see, you're learning about God here. But God is also gracious. Amen. So when he comes to talk to someone, he knows it's hard to hear when you're scared. Amen. So he says, fear not. Don't fear, Abram. Don't fear. <coughs> yes, yeah, something indeed to be learned. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As Philippians 2.12 says, when we're dealing with God, God graciously keeps us from shaking, so to speak. It's a very gracious uh, accommodation. What's the first thing he says? He says, I'm your shield. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing he says. I'm your shield. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I'm here to protect you, yeah. not destroy you. Oh, that's good to know. When that, when that dawned on me, see, I had a view of God that God's going to be looking for a reason to send you to hell. That's really what I thought. And I tried to, I didn't want to go to hell, so I tried to conduct my life so I wouldn't. But when I found out God wasn't looking for a reason to condemn me, it made me successful. And, and please, it affected me just the wrong opposite way. Now, how did that happen? That's God. He, he, he convinced of you, too, of the truth. I'm your shield. You got a lot going against you, but I'm your shield. You, you have a devil who successfully deceived everyone that's ever been born but Jesus, but, but I'm your shield. Don't, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. Divine protection. Why are you here tonight? God's your shield. Amen. That's why you're here. Why, why haven't you been overcome by things that maybe you thought were going to overcome you? you? God is your shield. And that's not all. He's, he says, I am your exceeding great reward. That's, uh, that's, that's quite an expression. Some of the different versions represent it in my judgment, in unacceptable ways. Like the New American Standard says, your reward shall be great. The NIV reads, your very great reward, with the footnote, your reward will be very great. Your she I will give you a very great reward, the New Jerusalem Bible says. Living Bible says, I will give you great blessings. Apost Apostolic Bible says, your wage much will be exceedingly. The literal interpretation of the Bible says, your reward shall in will increase greatly. And, and the Message Bible says, your reward will be grand. See, now those neutralize the text. That's not what God was saying. God said exactly what he meant. I, if you have me, Abram, you've got it all. That's what he's saying. I am your reward. Well, let's put it this way. I'll give myself to you. See, if you trust him, if you believe in him, God's on your side. You really don't need anything else. Because everything's in subjection to him. And he has all the resources. So it's good to know. I am your exceeding great reward. Now this is not a new kind of expression. People talk like this even back under the Old Covenant. Second Chronicles 13, 12. Ab Abijah the prophet said, God himself is with us for our captain. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. Abijah. I, want, I don't want to have to wait to get to heaven and find out who Abijah was. Abijah says God himself, mm -hmm. see, is our captain. Yeah, yeah. 
And David, he said, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance. I cried unto the Lord and I said, thou art my refuge and my portion. See, that's, that's like reward. Jeremiah said, the Lord is my portion. John in the Isle of Patmos, he saw the into the eternity future. He said, God himself shall be with them. So I, that's a wonderful, I am thy great, exceeding great reward. Don't look for anything anywhere else. The statement, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward is intended to confirm the thorough adequacy of the Lord. Now to this day, men, religious men, professed Christian men, for one reason or another, insist on thinking is Jesus plus something else. It's God. And we've got people, we've got schools that say will make you a better mm -hmm. minister. Yeah. We've got a plan that will make you live more successful. And there's all kind of these things going on. But once this registers on your spirit, I am thy exceeding great reward. He becomes your only source. Amen. If you get anything from somebody else, it's because God Amen. gave it through somebody else. See, that, that's how it works. Now, Abram's going to respond to this. And Abram said, so far as the record's concerned, there's been several confrontations Abram's had with God. His original call in Genesis 12, separate. God appeared to him at Shechem when he got to Canaan. Said that his seed would inherit the land. God spoke to Abram after Lot separated from him and said, I'm going to give you the land. Now the word of God comes to Abram in a vision. Now this will be the most extensive word to, to this point that God has given to Abram. And here's how God works. It starts small, it ends big. This is the way God works now. God doesn't have a, a mini vision here, a mini vision there, a mini vision. That isn't the way it works. It increases as it goes. God would make, uh, here's some things that uh, God said he'd do. He'd show him, the, he said, I'll show you the land. That's the first thing he show, told him. I'll show you the land. Come to a land that I will show you. That's, that's all he told him. Then God said, I'll make of it you a great, bless, a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless him that bless you. I'll curse him that curse you. And you all families of the earth will be blessed. Did the next vision, he, word, he told him he'd give Abram and his and his seed, all the land he saw. Then he told him he'd make Abram seed as the dust of the earth, stars of the heaven. Then he told him that he was his shield and seed and great reward. Then he told him that his steward would not be his heir. Then he told him that his heir would be begotten by himself, not another. Then the Lord brought Abram the Lord brought Abram out of the air of the Chaldees, he told him, so he could inherit the land. Abram's seed would be in a strange land, and I won't read the rest of these. But it, Now, how does that compare with what you know about God? All those things he let him know. How does that compare? Did you notice in every one of those things, God told him what he was going to do with him? But when you get up into Christ, God is showing you himself yeah. uh -huh. he's unveiling himself in Christ and what he's prepared for them that love him yeah. Amen. all of a sudden he's not talking about earth yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. that's how it started now because uh -huh. this was the beginning uh -huh. but as time progressed even Abraham sensed it's got to be more than this uh -huh. Uh -huh. now notice that the <laughs> Only interpretation of the past pertained to Abram leaving Ur of the Chaldees. That's, that's the only view of the past and the interpretation of the past. All the other revelations per pertain to the future. 
and required faith to apprehend. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> and as I mentioned, there's a progression in the thoughts also. And Abram said, Lord God, let's see. The last person that said that was Noah, which is about 1,600 years before Abram. He said, Lord, the God, the blessed be the Lord God of Shem. That's, that was not a common expression. And Noah used a little different words from the Hebrew. Abram refers to God as Lord God, only the second person who in English has ever said those words. The Hebrew words mean Lord of justice, the eternal existing one. You see, God hasn't revealed himself yet as the eternal yeah. existing one. Right. <laughs> but Abram, he's picked up on this. He's picked up on this, refers to him appropriately. He doesn't call him daddy, yeah, that's right. for sure. Supreme one. Now remember, he came from an idolatrous background. Joshua mentions it in Joshua 24 too. Abram came from an idolatrous background. And I've already told you that times he's a, God's spoken to him, which has been about four times, He's already picked up on something that a lot of people you personally know haven't picked up on. There's a lot of God. Anytime God says something or does something, there's a lot of God in that thing. And if a person can see it, you'll see a lot. Been exposed to far less revelation now than you have or I have. But he was convinced of the uniqueness of God and the falsity of all others. And there's no record ever, any place at any time, that Abram ever followed any other God after that. Amen. Amen. Never. He never unduly honored a man. Never. Never. Not one time. Those mi minor and few exposures to God so impacted Abraham mm -hmm. that he from that time on didn't feel at home in this world. Yeah, that's now that's the genuine God we're talking about. Yeah. It's a perception. He saw what we know by revelation. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when a person prays, oh God, if there is a God... The prayer hits the ceiling and comes back down. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And sometimes that not, that's not as easy as what someone might think. <coughs> By way of comparison, Abram did believe God was who he said he was. I, Shield and exceeding great reward. <clears throat> now he says to God, he's thinking of what God has said. Your seed is going to possess the land. See, God doesn't mention it in this vision yet. But he remembers, God has said, your seed's going to possess this land. I'm bringing you out. The first thing he told him when he got to Canaan in Shechem, the first thing he told him was, I'm giving this land to your seed. That's the first thing he said. Now some years have passed. He has no seed. He has no further revelation on it. And so he brings up the matter that he's sort of made provisions for who, someone taking over his house after he leaves. My chief steward, Eliezer. And he evidently was born in Abram's house. He was a servant of a servant of Abram. So he said, uh, the, my steward, the steward of my house is Eliezer. Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. So this, this must be the answer. He didn't stop believing God. He was believing God. But he could, his faith could not go beyond what God had said. 
So I'll take the text as it stands. No attempt to further define Eliezer. He's Eliezer of Damascus. Steward the ruled all his house. Now it may appear on the surface that Abram's struggling with unbelief. But you can't have unbelief if you can't even heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, unbelief depicts that something's been heard and told and he didn't believe it. But he hasn't been told yeah. yet that he's going to bear his own, going to beget his own son. He had, God hasn't divulged this to him yet. So he's doing the best he can to think it out with the promise in mind. In other words, he's saying, look, here's the land. I'm, an old, I'm, I'm passing away. I'm getting older. What, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this, Lord? Certain about the reality of the promise is how it's going to happen. He didn't. He didn't know, so God didn't say, I rebuke you for questioning me like that. He didn't say that. He said, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. No. Elias was a good servant. You can send him out to find Isaac's wife and all that. He's a good servant. He's not going to be the heir. He that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be your heir. Well, that's the first time. That's the first time now. God has told him this. The word of the Lord came to him. And I just the other times there. I think it's one, two, three, four times. Four revelations from God. This is the first time this is made known to him. Hell, he's not going to be it. And that was it. Abram never brought him up again. That's right. He didn't have a son right away. Remember, he didn't know Sarah was going to be the mother until the year before Isaac was born. Mm -hmm. The year before Isaac was born, when Abram was 99 years old, then God told him the next piece of the revelation, that Sarah was going to be the mother. <laughs> Don't tell me Abram didn't have faith. Amen. Yeah. Now it's a... <clears throat> He shall not be thine ear. Now here we're introduced to another different kind of phenomenon. Ordinarily an heir pertains to inheriting the goods and possessions of the person. But that's not what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about inheriting a promise. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Inheriting a promise. Who ever heard anything like that? I mean... You won't go to any lawyer and tell them, what do you have, some kind of a form, how you can, my children can inherit a promise? They say, inherit a promise? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Inherit a promise. Paul said of this event, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. So it's important that God told Abraham, I'm going to give this land to you. So he's got to tell us, now you're going to inherit the promise, Isaac. The pro I'm going to give you the land. And Isaac tells Jacob, now you're going to inherit the promise. The promise is going to be given. Mm -hmm. That actually what we're living on. We are living on an inherited promise. Amen. Promise God has left, what he's going to do to those that love him. It's, it's the promise that we've inherited. Some generations don't have a promise. They haven't inherited a promise. See, we're, we're living in a time when I'm, I'm ashamed to say this, but some people have not passed the promise along to their children. They haven't told them what God's going to do. How he's going to take away the world, he's going to take us and gather us to himself. They haven't told them this. That's the promise that we're inheriting. See? And Abraham was faithful now to pass this along because yeah. some hundreds of years later, Joseph, uh, Joseph knew about this. Yeah. We're headed for the land. Take my bones when you move out of here. Yeah. How, why was he able to say that? They, it passed along the promise that was inherited. Inheriting a promise. Exceeding great and precious. That's right. <laughs> Hebrews 6.12 says, Now, be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And, and Paul reminds you, Now all the promises of God are yea and amen to the glory of God by us. 
See, so, so tell us about the promises, because that's what we're going. That's what we're inheriting. Amen. Galatians six twenty nine. If ye be Christ's, <coughs> then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. Now, just before that, he said, he saith not to seeds as to many, but seed which is one. Which, which seed is Christ? Mm -hmm. Verse sixteen. Which seed is Christ? Mm -hmm. Now he comes out to those that are in Christ. He said, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's potent stuff, isn't it? Amen. That is rich. Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. Not to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the covenant was made with Christ. Yes. But if you're in Christ, you get it too. We are joint heir with Christ. And <laughs> we will reign with him, so forth. Daniel saw the time when the saints took the kingdom. Daniel 7, 18, 22 and 29. Jesus said, Blessed are you, persecuted for righteousness' sake, for yours is the kingdom. Well, the kingdom is the Lord's, was the watchword all along. Why does he say yours is the kingdom? Because if you're in Christ, you get what Christ has. Amen. And he has it to distribute it to you. So this utterly devastates the idea that we have what we have now is everything God has to give. We have what God has to give now, but this, the half has not been told. Yes. Amen. Amen. But then the half has not been told. Yeah. What's reserved for them that fear him and love him. And you're, you're going to inherit that, mm -hmm. that promise. Pl place great value on the promises. Yeah. God continues, he shall come forth out of thine own bowels. The word bowels, in inward organs, we would call it, one of which is reproductive organs. The idea is that it would look on the surface like the seed was natural. And they went through the natural means. But Abraham was given strength in his body, and Sarah by faith received strength to conceive. But it looked like a newspaper reporter would just say an old woman had a child. That's what a newspaper reporter would say. But God is the one that actually was doing it. Here he divulges it to them. Now, from this perspective, and it, uh, there's no record that Abram ever doubted this. None. In fact, the record is that he didn't doubt it. From, from this perspective, spiritual growth may be viewed as receiving the word of God and incorporating it. Abraham began to live around this promise. Right. This promise was everything to him. He didn't care if they reported there's a luxury, luxurious farm for sale in Egypt, you know, or... Up there in Haran, there's a great layout that just fits you. Nice home, nice property. He never thought of anything else but this. It consumed, it consumed him. This is why we, we preach and why we teach and try and convince people what God has done because we know that if this ever gets into your spirit and you're dominated by it, you'll live different. You'll live right. We won't have to be browbeating you about life. Amen. Not if this registers with you. You'll do like Abram did. Walk by faith. Then God's going to confirm his faith some more. Now notice the way he's doing this. He doesn't work a special sign or work a special wonder. Mm -hmm. He says something else. He says something else. Yeah. <laughs> you see this? Faith comes by hearing. He's making this sure by saying something, not by doing something. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them, well, be a challenging circumstance. Now, here you've probably never seen very many stars. There are parts of our country where you can see the stars, but most around the city, like you can't even just see a few here and there. But you get in some of these foreign countries. I, you, I saw one time I was able to see the stars for multitude, and I couldn't stand. I got dizzy. I, I lost my sense of balance. It was so staggering that I. See if you can count them. And he says, so shall your seed be. Abraham didn't say, how can these things be? 
Why? Why didn't he? Because he he become familiar with God. No more than was revealed to him. He knew a lot about God. God he knew God can't lie, even though that scripture hadn't been written yet. He knew it. So shall I seed be. The same God who put the stars in their place will summon forth an exceeding large number of children from an old man that's procreatively speaking dead who has a wife that's been barren from the day she is married. That's like that's the God who will do that? The God that See why it's wrong to believe in evolution? Yeah, right. If you believe in evolution, you can't say things like this. You can say, behold the stars. They evolved over billions of years, and there's still new stars being created. And you can't believe that and, and rest in God. It's a fixed creation up there. Now, how will faith react to this? This is quite a... Quite a promise. Here's a man that's getting aged. He's uh, impotent so far as procreation is concerned. His wife Sarah is barren. Now, if everyone said, Sarah, go into the town to the oncologist and ask him if, if he thinks this is possible for us to have a son. <laughs> yeah, and college would say, "What's wrong with you? Yeah. No, you can't. You don't have the means. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. The means to reproduce children don't exist." Mm -hmm. Abraham, he here's what it says, and he believed in the Lord. Amen. There it is. That's right. <laughs> that's the first time God, Abraham, has said anything in response to God. Two times he called upon the name of the Lord, but this time he he talked to the Lord. And faith, like, leaps forward and doubt falls down behind. <laughs> Amen. See, faith is a substance of the, substance of things for and the evidence of things not seen. So if you believe God, you got you got it. Yeah, right. Now you got it in your grasp. Works this way. Uh, yes, we all, he does. we all, uh, mm -hmm. he reveals things to each one of us in different stages, and then mm -hmm. our faith grabs hold That's of it. Right. And and I mean, even in your, yourself, the Lord reveals something to you, and you can't really explain it to anybody else, but you know it. <laughs> Amen. You know? Amen. Amen. Confident, you have confidence, yep. but as you say, you can't satisfactorily mm -hmm. explain it unless the other person's had the yeah. same experience. <laughs> <laughs> then they'll say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Then what does that do? That that bolsters you up. See, right. yeah, I, you know what I'm talking about. It does something for you when that happens. <laughs> Mary and Elizabeth speaking. That's right. One another. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> he believed, now I like the way it stated here, he believed in the Lord. Some versions say he put his trust in the Lord. He believed God. He relied on God. And the word in is in the Hebrew text. The other, when it's quoted in the New Covenant Scripture, it says he believed God. Here it says he believed in the Lord. Now the difference is that in that time, this was a monumental work at this time. So he believed in the Lord. That is, we might say he, he knew the Lord could do this. He knew the Lord could do this. And this would pertain to everything God has said up to this point. I'll make thee a great nation. You'll be a blessing. All of heaven's earth be blessed. Your seed will be as numerous as the seed. I'm your shield and a great reward. Of your own bowels. See that I believed in the Lord encompassed all of, all of that. There's more in what God promises than most men dare to believe. God makes a promise, and Satan will got, try and get you to diagnose the promise to see whether it really is possible or not. But faith says, take, take, hold, take hold of that. If God said that, take hold of that. Depend on it. If you gotta, you're going to have to adjust your life some way, adjust it around this, this promise. 
If he says you're going to, you're going to, meek are going to inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, then you aren't so anxious to get a lot of it now. Yeah. You got to, get, you got to get it all, brethren. You're going to get it all. Why be covetous? If just a, for a handful, you're going to have to give up. He's going to give the whole kit and caboodle to you. That's right. Going to take the kingdom, all of it, all of it. We'll inherit all things. That's what the scripture says. All things are yours. Most of them are yours by promise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hold in there now. Don't, don't. If you don't have much, like, so what? <laughs> so what? Abraham believed in the Lord. Now, the, both this text is quoted by both Paul and James, who some people pit Paul against James, you know. And if you say Paul says we're justified by faith without works, people say, yeah, but James said we're justified by works. Or they fuss about it. Of course, they weren't talking about the same thing at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul was talking about the foundation that causes justification, and James was rebuking people who said they believed, but they didn't. Yeah. He sold it. He said, you're adulterers and adulteresses. Mm -hmm. You're friends of the world. You don't really have faith because what faith does isn't being done in you. Yeah. That's what James is writing about. Amen. Same is true today. If a person doesn't have the fruits of faith, we don't want to hear them talking about how they believe God and all that. So don't talk about it. If you don't have the works of faith, don't be talking about how, what kind of faith you have. Work on getting faith. Yeah, amen. And he counted his faith to him for righteousness. Reckoned it to him, some say. Credited it to him. Put it to his account for righteousness. Well, let's, uh, let's strip it down to kind of the bare essentials. The only righteousness you really have is your faith. That faith is what, when God looks at you as being righteous, he's looking at your faith. Yeah. He counted his faith. Right. Other places, he imputed it mm -hmm. to him for right. That was his righteousness. It's like, here's the person, faith is over, and this faith, that's what, mm -hmm. no person without faith is in any way righteous. Amen. Mm -hmm. Even though their life may be lived meticulously. Yeah, right. And they may be very disciplined in their procedures and but if they don't have faith, they aren't righteous. His faith was counted to him. This is how serious God is about saving people. Who but God could come up with something like this? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Counting your faith uh -huh. as your righteousness. Yeah. Why? Because faith takes hold of God regardless. Mm -hmm. it, it, faith doesn't doubt. Faith is a substance. Of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. Now Abraham, after God clarifying about his seed, he just he quits thinking about Eliezer and he starts thinking about God. Mm -hmm. He records on God and God says, That's it. Yeah. I'm gonna consider you righteous now. In other words, Abraham wasn't left to guess about this matter. Now here's how this account we read, here's how it's written up by Paul. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which are be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so that thy seed be, so shall thy seed be, and be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. <laughs> so what did Abram do? What exactly did he do? Well, against hope, he believed in hope. That is to say, there was no humanly logical reason to anticipate this actually happening. But against that, against human hope, he, he believed in hope anyway. When there was nothing left to hope for, he hoped anyway. What else did he do? Well, he was strong in faith. 
Abram's faith was not feeble. It was strong. That's what it says. Amen. His faith filled him with power. A weak faith can't sustain a person, as Peter can tell you. When he sank beneath the wave, the Lord said, Oh, ye have little faith. Wherefore did you doubt? That wasn't said to Abram. God didn't say to Abram, Why did you doubt? That wasn't said to Abram. And he gave glory to God. God was glorified because Abraham's faith drew attention to God. He began to live in anticipation of what God was going to do. Now the only question is going to be when. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not how. What else did he do? He was fully persuaded. <laughs> fully persuaded. No more questions. No doubt. His only concern had been how the promise would be fulfilled. Now he doesn't. He's not thinking about that anymore. Fully persuaded. All right. Does that sound like Abraham didn't believe? There's their inspired record. What What were some things Abram didn't did not do? He was not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body. He did not consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, there are two different views of this. He did not consider his own body. Some of the versions reflect these views. Though his body seemed to him to be little better than dead, through faith he regarded the facts. He was not sickly in faith while contemplating his inert body. These are versions of the Bible now I'm reading to you. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. But the scriptures say he didn't consider that. He didn't consider that condition. These versions say that's what he considered. And when he considered it, he said, well, that's a complete misrepresentation of the case. Faith doesn't look at what, at the handicaps. Faith looks at the promise. And beholds it. Abram's faith was strong because he he didn't review the earthly circumstances. Now, I, I did want to say a word about the pers about faith, because there are people in Scripture that appear as though the faith failed and they were weak and so forth. But faith is evaluated only after it has been tested. Faith is not evaluated during the test. Yeah. Now we have an example of this in, in Peter. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, Satan desired to have you, to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. Mm -hmm. And his faith didn't fail. That's right. You say, well, he denied Christ before the night was over. He recouped. Yeah, that's right. His faith didn't fail. Uh -huh. See? He was tested. Mm -hmm. It looked on the test like he was knocked down. That's how it looked. But when something happened, Satan didn't recognize He got up. That's right. <laughs> That's what happens. Though. Even Solomon said, the righteous fall seven times and get up. Mm -hmm. See, that when your faith is tested, you'll have experiences that will look mm -hmm. like you didn't believe. Mm -hmm. But if you keep hold of the promise, sometimes the promise, like it's like it falls out of your hand and it's laying about two feet away there and you've been knocked off your butt, just stress out there and... Mm -hmm get a hold of it again and if you if you end up if after the test is done mm -hmm. you if you end up standing and believing it's reckoned that your faith didn't fail Amen. Amen. that's how it's going to be at the end of the world that's, right. that's how it's going to be if you if when Jesus comes your faith's intact you may have had some bobbles along the way <laughs> that were disappointed to you but if you came through the fire your faith worked Amen. and didn't fail. Simple as that seemed. That's kind of a fresh perspective to me, but it I kind of sensed it, but I just had never put it in words. <laughs> to me, that's a wonderful thing to know. Amen. So now the ex if you're going through a test, the thing you're focused on isn't on the 
particular trial you're enduring, but it's on, it's on making it through it. Holding fast, putting on the whole armor, pressing toward the mark. See, sometimes when you press toward the mark, you got to go through some things that, de like they delay you a little bit. Yeah. That's kind of a clumsy way to say it, but it, it, like it appears as though it's holding you back. But you can, God's remember, God's strengthening you. That's right. <coughs> and you can go through it. You're believing, but you might still be trembling. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? But you still believe. Oh yeah. See, God doesn't. God doesn't tell you, "Don't worry." He, he, see, this is just the way the thing works. It, mm -hmm. it seems like you're expending all the energy you can, and it seems to you like you're kind of going backward. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's happening. You're standing. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when you're not making a lot of progress, but you're standing. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes oh, you're almost knocked off your feet. Mm -hmm. When it's all past, faith endures till Isaac is born. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> now God says to um, Abraham, I am the Lord that brought you, brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees mm -hmm. to give you this land. I did that. All right, now when we read about Abram coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, it says that Abram went out and Abram took and uh, that uh, Tiro went out and took Abram and Lot with him. That's how, that's how the record says in Genesis 11.31. It looks like Tiro led the expedition out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this is God talking. Yeah. God says, I brought you out. Mm -hmm. Now I've heard people say, well, Abram didn't obey God. God said, get out, and he stayed. Mm -hmm. He stayed there. Took his dad with him, and he told him to separate. Mm -hmm. All right, after all those explanations have been given, yeah. here's God now. That's right. I brought you out. Amen. Just as surely as he brought Israel out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If a newspaper reporter had reported about the Exodus, he would have said, strangest thing happened. The people just walked out of the <laughs> land, and even a dog didn't bark at them when they're on the way. It's the most peculiar phenomenon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we know why God let them out. Amen. Amen. Same yeah. with Abram. This is how God did... Oh, Mm -hmm. This point, this is just these are just my own thoughts here. Mm -hmm. From Ur of the Chaldees to Shechem and Canaan was fifteen hundred miles. That's uh, by foot, with all your possessions taken mm -hmm. with you, all your flocks, all your herds. <laughs> they didn't have a train or a bus or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the way I see it, God knew it was going to take a while to get. Mm -hmm. It was 800 miles to Haran. 800 miles from Ur to Haran. Take a little while to negotiate that. So God kind of started early. So when he got to Haran, Terah Tira died. Mm -hmm. See? But he had made some significant progress already. So God t timed this. Yeah. Right? So he'd have less uh, encumbrances when he got to Haran. He brought him out. Mm. And how do you account for your exodus from sin? Mm. Like, how do you account Amen. for it? Mm -hmm. You've got you. You can say, "Well, so and so preached to me, and I did this." And these, this is all true. Yeah. Uh -huh. But if you want to give glory to God, say, "God brought me out." Amen. God, let me tell you, God brought me out. He used people. Yes. yes he, he used people I knew, and he used this, and he, but he's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the scripture says that he put us in Christ, 1 Amen. Corinthians 1.30. Yeah. He delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of God's dear son. That's something God did. Mm -hmm. But it didn't look like that mm -hmm. to the human eye. Yeah. But that's the way it really was. Amen. And so that you will learn that from uh, Abram. I brought mm -hmm. thee out. That's God strengthening Abram. It's like mm -hmm. if Abram was ever tempted to look at it the other way, God just affirmed this. Just to, yeah. I did this, Abram. I brought you out. And Abram says, well, where? I brought you out to give you the land. Yeah. Uh -huh. Abram says, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Mm -hmm. Now this is important because this is almost the identical question that Zechariah Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, asked. Yeah. It's almost the identical question. Mm -hmm. When Gabriel appeared to him 
and told him that he and Elizabeth, both were stricken in age, mm -hmm. were going to have a son. He said, whereby shall I know this? Mm -hmm. For I'm an old man, and my wife a well stricken with, with a year. So that's almost identically the same mm -hmm. question Abraham asked. But, but there had been more light oh, yeah. when Zechariah asked this question. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in the kind of condition Abraham was in. Mm -hmm. But then the next question, Moses and the prophets had delivered their ministry and the psalmist had written all of his psalms and John the Baptist had, was going to come on the scene if he were getting prepared for it. Mm -hmm. It was a more light had been shed on it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Gabriel told him, well, since you asked that question, you won't be able to speak till he's born. Mm -hmm. That's not what he said to Abram. <laughs> He said, well, here, but I want you to do something. I want you to take a heifer. Mm -hmm. That's a cow that has calved. Mm -hmm. Take a she-goat that can have, take a ram mm -hmm. in order for strength. Take a turtle dove and take a dove. That's a young, young dove. Mm -hmm. uh, here, here's what, here's what he what he actually said, take me a heifer of three years old and a she go to three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a pigeon. And as far as the record goes, he didn't tell them what to do with these. Would they put them in a pen maybe and save them? He seemed to sense that when you give something to God, it's, it's got to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like this is something, mm -hmm. this is something these ancients kind of knew intuitively. But he did something, and we don't, we don't, I don't have all the answers for why he did this. There's ans people have supplied some answers, but if I can't prove what's said, I just don't adopt what the view is. But mm -hmm. yeah. He took these, and he cut them in half, mm -hmm. except for the birds. Then he laid them out on the ground, side by side. Mm -hmm. The halves, side by side. Mm -hmm. The birds, he didn't... He didn't divide them. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether this was a sacrifice or not. There's no mention of blood or anything mm -hmm. like that. So this is kind of a unique mm -hmm. circumstance. <coughs> there is something mentioned in Scripture that tells us that birds weren't to be divided. Under the law, mm -hmm. here's, what it, here's what it said. If the burnt sacrifice for his offering of the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or, two, or young pigeons, and the priest shall bring it under the altar and wring <coughs> off its head and turn it, burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall he wrung out at the side of the altar, mm -hmm. and he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar in the east part by the place of the ashes, and he shall cleave it with the wings thereof. But shall not divide it asunder. Mm -hmm. right, it seems as though the work of the law was in Abram's mm -hmm. heart. He knew something that actually was revealed later on. Mm -hmm. Why it was this way, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Some are of the opinion that God directed Abram to do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He doesn't say. Mm -hmm. There's a text in Scripture in Jeremiah that Leaves us with the impression that this was like a, a way of making a covenant. Was you'd you'd kill an animal, split them in half, and then you'd walk between the animals and make the make the covenant. Mm -hmm. And he refers to this in Jeremiah thirty four eighteen. I will give the men that transgress my covenant, which have not performed, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the extent. Of Mm -hmm. But we know about it, but it seems though this was associated with making a covenant. The idea was that if I don't keep the covenant, I'll be cut in half like these yeah. pieces are, something mm -hmm. of that sort. So he did, and, but while the carcass is laying there, the vultures kind of mm -hmm. came. Mm -hmm. And the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see how serious he was? Yeah. Yeah. So, this is, he said, these are for me. Take these for me. That's uh -huh. what we're going to take these animals for me. Mm -hmm. So here come the vultures. He drives them away. Yeah. 
Now the thing to be seen here is that what's given to God can't be shared with anyone else. Yes. Amen. Present your body a living sacrifice yeah. to God. Uh -huh. See, no, not to anybody else. To God. When the devil's birds come, you got to shoo them away. <laughs> yeah. They come. They want to take advantage of what you. The fact that you've given your hold to the Lord, they want to take advantage of that. Yeah. See, don't shoo them away. <clears throat> No believer has a right to give himself to anyone <coughs> but God. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know how much time passed, but when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell uh, upon Abram. Lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. God said, No of a surety now, no of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now that's this that's not for five hundred years. That's not going to happen for five hundred years. So what does this do to a theology that says, well, what I want to know is what does God have for us now? What, what does that do to that? <laughs> what does that do to that? Here's something going to bad happen long after Abram dies. He reveals it to him. So God's not interested just in meeting. The here and now, and each have here and now. He can do this. I understand that, but that's not what he's what he's ultimately seeking to do. He is the ancient of days. The ancient of days. That's right. Now, a deep sleep fell on Abram. I think it was like for his protection. I think the Lord, the Lord dealing with him was. It had to be best to be asleep, <laughs> and not not see what was going on. Deep sleep fell upon him. And there are several people in Scripture that a deep sleep come on them when God worked with them. Like Adam, a deep sleep when God took one of his ribs. When David took a spear and a jug from King Saul, Saul fell in deep, was in a deep sleep. Eliaphaz has told Job, a thing secretly is brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof, and thoughts from the visions when deep sleep falleth upon me. Job said, God speaks once, yes, twice, Yet men perceiveth it not in a dream and a vision of the night when deep sleep fall upon them. Gabriel appeared to Daniel when he was in a deep sleep. You know, there's a immense level of sobriety and of ten, attentiveness that was on Abram when God is talking to him. He's in a deep sleep, but he was in some ways conscious and still aware of what was going on. It's a proper posture of hearing is to be alert, undistracted. I can only speak for myself here, but I'm deeply concerned for the lack of godly fear I perceive in the modern church. I think it's, it's at a minimum level. And when God speaks to anyone, it involves a revelation of something that was not basically known before. That gives all the more reason to be, be be attentive. God doesn't appear and give you a review of what he said before. This, this is not the way God is. He, that's why he gave you his word. He's not going to say it to you and to come next year and say it again to you. This isn't the way God works. The scriptures indicate that if a person does not believe what God has said, further insight is withheld. That's, that's it. That's it. Till the person humbles down, receive what was said first. That's it. Won't get any more. In fact, the scripture says if you don't receive the love of the truth, he'll send strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth. Now, some people say, well, oh, there's a discrepancy here. There's all kinds of mistakes in the Bible, you know, the scribal errors and interpolations by the scribes. It says here 400 years. And Moses said it's 430 years. So there you are, some kind of scribal error happened. No, this isn't the case at all. He didn't say they'd be in Egypt 400 years. He said they'd be afflicted 400 years. Now when Jacob went down into Egypt, he was 130 years old. That's Genesis 47.9. When he died, he was 150... 147 years old, that's 17 years, that they lived in, 
they didn't have affliction yeah. back in those days. Sometime after that, a Pharaoh came that didn't know Joseph, and he began to afflict yeah. Israel, and they became slaves. I've already counted for 17 years. I gather that the 13 years that we need more were the eight years when things were going pretty well for them. Till this, so that so the they were afflicted for 400 years, but they were in Egypt 430 years. Amen. That's the idea. He mentions the affliction because that's why he's going to bring them out. So he's going to bring them out because they're afflicted. They were afflicted. Now I said that nation. God's telling Abram this because he knows he can trust him to pass this along. Amen. I know Abram, he said, that he would command his children after him. So he could pass, he knew he could count on this. Yes. Also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and after it shall they come out with great substance. Now, not to make this too long, he actually, when he judged the nation, he was also judging their gods. And he said so when he, when he brought these judgments to pass. He was judging their gods. Their gods couldn't save them. Now, how, how a person does this, you have to kind of think it out for yourself. But I think it's, it's right to let people know the gods you've been serving haven't been doing very much for us. We're seeing this moral decline and... Everything happening, and it looks to me like whoever you are serving, whoever it is, it's not working. Yes. Amen. I think that does need to be said. Because yeah. the religion we got on our hands is what's been taught. This is the result of what people have been taught. I'm going to judge that nation. But then people are going to come out with great substance. Kind of like back pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Going to come out with great substance. And this actually happened when God called Moses, got him ready to deliver Israel. He said, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, Moses. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. It's to come to pass when ye go, ye shall go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, of her that sojourneth in her house. Jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. Ye shall spoil the Egyptians. That's when he first, that's at the bush. Mm -hmm. That was made known at the bush. Then they got ready to come out, kind of shortly before they came out. Exodus 11, 1. The Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. Mm -hmm. When he shall let you go, surely thrust you out hence to all together speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver jewels of gold the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians moreover the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt this is after he went back huh in the eyes in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people how about that So the children of Israel, according to the word of the Lord, and they borrowed the Egyptians' jewel of silver, jewels of gold, and, and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they went out, went, uh, lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Amen. Then Psalm 105 says, He brought them out, brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Yeah. How about that? I, you suppose that there's any given day on earth when there's not a feeble person among the church? You among us. Yeah. It's just there with Don to all sitting in the room here. Now we're talking two, three, somewhere between two and five million people. There wasn't a sickly or feeble person in the bunch. Yeah. None. Now, of course, this also, this gold and silver and jewels was used in the construction of the tabernacle. That's what it was for. So they, I mean, when you're wandering in the desert, you've really got no need for gold and silver and so forth. Yeah, and that's why I was just considering that I hadn't 
really put the two and two together, but the language here about borrowing yeah. from the Egyptians and that the Egyptians lent unto yeah. them, mm -hmm. it shows that they were stewards. That's and right. This time that they were going to use it for the Lord. They Amen. Were mm -hmm. Amen. <coughs> and he assures, uh, he assures Abram, you'll, you'll go to your fathers in peace now. You're not going to have to fight any more wars like you did with Cheddar Lamer. You won't have to do that anymore. You'll be buried in a good old age. Yeah. You're going to live a long while yet. 175. He lived to be 175. So he lived 75 years after Isaac was born. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you're going to go to your fathers. Now soul sleepers think that means that you just went to the grave. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that's the case. Several people in the scripture were said to be gathered to their fathers. Yes. God spoke to the king of Judah regarding being gathered to people and to the grave as well. In 2 Kings 22 20. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered unto thy grave in peace. So, both of them. You'll be buried in a good old age, as 175. Yeah, that was kind of young compared to what, yeah. how long people used to live. I listed some of them here. Some of the oldest, Adam, 930, Jared, 962, Methuselah, 969, Noah, 950, I mean, 175, that <laughs> doesn't sound like much next to that. But death had entered the movement race. Yeah. And death was great, the, the age was gradually diminishing until very shortly 239 kind of, kind of leveled off and then 100 something leveled off and finally 80 and by reason, four, three score and 10 and by reason of strength 80. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's showing that death did, did take place. Right. Now God says, uh, in the fourth generation, they'll come out again. Now remember again, he's talking way up. Nothing to do with Abraham where he is now. Fourth generation. Generation one, Isaac. Generation two, Jacob. Generation three, 12 sons. Generation four, 12 tribes. Fourth generation. After Jacob's born his 12 sons, his 12 sons of tribes started because they came out by tribes. The tribes came out. Yeah. Now the revelation of this fact it seems to me an able discerning Israelites to kind of calculate roughly when the deliverance is going to come. We know that Jeremiah, he, he knew by, uh, Daniel knew by Jeremiah's books when the captivity, Babylon captivity is about over. He knew by books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me they could kind of, Joseph would kind of say, you know, this is the fourth generation. We're, we're in the fourth generation, beginning of it. He said, we're going to be delivered shortly, folk. I just get ready. This is no doubt why Moses thought the children of Israel should have known he was going to deliver them. Remember, before, before he fled Egypt, he said he thought they would know. Why did he think that? Well, I, he probably knew he was in, the, in this generation, the fourth generation. Going to bring him out. But I'm, I'm waiting, though, I'm waiting, uh, because the couple of the iniquity of the Amorites isn't full yet. So there's some, there's kind of like a breaking point. Iniquity is like fills up to finally God, that's it. So the iniquity of the Amorites wasn't full yet. So, so God's not going to expel these nations out of the land until it's evident that it's righteous for him to do so. Matter of fact, he told Moses and Joshua told him that these nations had defiled the land. They were idolatrous Nations burned their children to gods and all sorts of abominations they committed. And so he told them, uh, I'm going to drive them out because they defile my life. But you, you, don't you learn their way or I'll drive you out. That's what he told them. Now then a covenant's made. It came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, Abram saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the 
river of Egypt under the great river, the river Euphrates. And he names the nations that occupied that territory. Smoking furnace, heat, burning lamp, light. <laughs> heat and light go together. Now, this is a 24-hour day. All this happened in a day. This vision, all this revelation, all happened in a day. Be in the presence of God for a prolonged time. I might, well, Moses, like he was 40 days. He was 40 days in God's presence. I mean, it's staggering to consider. All this was to assure this is coming, Abram. In other words, he knows that th this has got to be passed on, so he stamps this indelibly on Abram's mind by this covenant, see? So that a to Abram, this is part of Abram. He's going to tell this mm -hmm. to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob and Jacob to Joseph and on down the line. They're going to pass it along. Amen. And he says, now you're going, to, you're going to expel these nations, the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, ten nations. Mm -hmm. You're going to kick them out of the land because they defiled it. Years later, Moses told it. He only listed seven. Deuteronomy 7, 1. The Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land with the Dagos to possess it and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Kenites, the Hyperazites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. All right, the ten nations were from the standpoint of the territory occupied by them. But at, then some years later, 500 years later, when they actually drove them out, he, he, Moses told the, the, the people, and seven of these groups were bigger than Israel was. See, seven of these groups were bigger than Israel was. And as I mentioned, the lands were dispossessed because they defiled the land. I give you some scriptures there. Now, I would remind you that Moses told the people in Deuteronomy. 32, 8, and 9, that this land always belonged to God, and this land was always intended to Israel. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. It wasn't until 2,000 years later 2,500 years later, God implemented this. After he divided the sons of Adam. It's amazing. So God has revealed Abram an inheritance that he himself would never experience in this world. But then again, this isn't the only world. <laughs> to the modern churchman, God's promise to Abram would have no relevance at all. And in fact, you preach a sermon about heaven, some people say, what? <laughs> That's pie in the sky by and by. I want to know what we get right now. Uh -huh. Well, see, this, this is God. We've learned a lot about him here. <coughs> I just named a few things here. I won't go over them. But you think of the things that you know about God that Abram didn't know. And then after you've thought about them, say now, is my life commensurately that much greater than Abraham's life? Or does Abraham outshine me after all these advantages? Such things ought not to be. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? It's kind of quiet tonight, brother. Yeah, the, um, you know, God told Abraham things that, if you just looked at them, they were absolutely an impossibility. That's right. And yet he, he had faith. He was strong in faith. I mean, and you bring that up to date, and God's told you that 2,000 years plus ago, he took away your sins when Jesus died on a yeah. cross. Now, oh, to the degree that you believe that, you'll have victory over sin. Yeah. You'll be able to say no and, you, and yes to God if you believe what he said. And, of course, that's just what he's done already. And yet, like you mentioned, the age is to come yeah. when he's going to show his kindness towards you. Do you really believe that? Because if you do, you'll have a dominating hope. 
That's what it will produce in you. Yes, you'll start right. hoping. Amen. You'll start wanting. The yes. Abraham lived in hope of the fulfillment of the promise. Amen. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, Brother Aaron. Thank the Lord. The Lord has a, a, his own way of emphasizing things. And he's obviously emphasized faith in, yes. in his dealings with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And there's at least a couple of reasons for that. One is because faith is, men have, uh, for whatever reason, have a tendency to misdiagnose faith. They have the wrong wrong idea of what of what faith is. Mm -hmm. So this, it's like this. Lord, the Lord has given this long, uh, profound explanation of what faith is in in Abraham. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. The, who is the father of us all? Yes, Mr. Barb. I was considering this, what you were talking about, Abraham only being able to reason by faith as far as the Lord had spoken. And this side of Christ, how thankful that I am that those who are in Christ, the reasoning of our faith doesn't have any limitations because the revelation mm. of God is so abundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Very good. Brother mm -hmm. Ricky? The way the Spirit says things, it says of Abraham that he believed in the Lord. In the Lord. And I kept thinking of expectation when you were talking about yeah. how his life, he now changed everything so that his life was entirely driven by the promise of God. And that's the way it is with everyone who walks by faith. In fact, in Hebrews 11, he mentions all manner of faith and all kinds of different kinds of works were done by faith. It wasn't yeah. faith doing the same thing in every way, and yet... In the midst of that, he says, these all died in faith. All Not. of them. Not having received the promises, but having seen them far off, were persuaded of them, and embraced them, yeah. and confessed that they were strangers on the earth. Amen. Now that's a wonderful aspect of Amen. faith, is the expectation we have of the Lord. Amen. Yes, Brother Tony? It, it sounds like that Abraham was looking for an opportunity to ask God about yeah. what he had promised him so yeah. much earlier. Yeah. It, it came right out yeah. when he had this good opportunity. But I was uh, you brought this point out, and I, I hadn't occurred to me, but it was very good. Now, he gave Abraham more to hear. He just told yeah. him more. Right. It would have been very Amen. easy for God to say, well, this this will be a sign. Mm -hmm. You know, for you when you see this and that. But what he done was he was teaching us the nature of faith. Amen. Right there with Abraham, yeah. and, he, and 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 Abraham was able to lock in on it because it was faith, that's and that's right. the way faith operates. Yeah. It, it operates by hearing. God just gave him more things to, to hear. You know, to, to right. grab hold of. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, in that light, if the apostles, their faith was increased because of what they heard Jesus say. That's right. It wasn't mm -hmm. because of Amen. the miracles that they saw. I mean, there were people in that day that didn't believe, mm -hmm. and they right. saw the miracles, but yeah. it was because of what they heard, and that's that's what faith, faith is, is we live by every word that proceeds from the yeah. mouth of God. Amen. So what he says I, I, is how we live. I see these miracles more and more as a judgment against the unbelievers, all the miracles that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so they, they believed not, even though they, the apostles believed their faith was based on what Jesus yeah. said. Like Sister Tasha said, the, the signs and miracles were were uh, judgment against the, uh, the multitudes who didn't believe. Yeah, the cities where he did most of his mighty works, he abraded with their unbelief. Yeah. Yes, Michael. Brother Mike. Uh, on a, <clears throat> when. The Lord told Abram, I am thy reward. Yeah. The, all the other translations you read there, it seems to me that they were focusing more on Abram than on God. Yeah, that's yes. right. I think they were yeah. they're, uh, thinking that the reward is like God was going to give him something as a reward for Abram doing something. And yeah. that's not the yeah. situation at all. Yeah, amen. amen. That God, God is a rewarder. That's just yeah. that's the way he is. It has yeah. nothing to do with what Abram did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also with Abraham's reasoning, based on what little information he had, he, he believed that God was going to do as he said, he just didn't know how. So that, that's why he reasoned that uh, Eliezer, Eliezer might be the heir. And then mm -hmm. later on he reasoned that uh, 
the child might be through Hagar because he didn't have all the information yet. And I was mm -hmm. thinking that's that's the way faith reasons it. Abraham or Abram didn't uh, doubt that God was going to do what he said. He just didn't know how. And this mm -hmm. same reasoning showed up later when God told him to offer up Isaac. That's right. He didn't know what was going to happen, yeah. but now the Apostle yeah. Paul tells us later on that in Hebrews that he had reasoned that God was going to raise him from the dead. Yeah. yeah. So if that's the same Abraham yeah. reasons the consistently throughout, he's he never doubted that God was going to do what he said, it's just he yeah. didn't know how. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And he didn't there weren't any precedents before him. Yeah. Of similar situations, see, we have we can read records of people that were in have experienced kind of what we have, but they he didn't have that. Yeah, that's right. Nothing like this is revealed like the Noah. Yeah. 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 Amen. But uh, it was interesting about the sacrifices too, that God didn't uh, spell out every as yeah. far as the record. Right. He didn't spell out every detail, yeah. but see, Abraham could think. Yeah, that's right. God had created man so he could think and he could figure. Well, God, I, I figure this is what God wants me to yeah. do, and mm -hmm. and and so he he cut those sacrifices in half and he laid them out. That's right. And uh, and he just proceeded with what he thought was best. God received it. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this thought of inheriting a promise that 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 so blessed me. I'm sorry I what didn't. I probably didn't communicate that as powerfully as it inheriting a promise. What. Yeah. <laughs> That's God for you. Yeah. It? Inherit a promise. Mm -hmm. As you tell your children, now Jesus is going to come again yeah, right. and take us to himself wow. and change our vile bodies so it'll be likened to his glorious body. You tell that. Mm -hmm. Tell that to your children. That's right. yeah, pass it along. See, we're in a generation now that several generations haven't been told that. Yeah. So we've got a younger generation that don't have it. They have no idea at all unless they're, they've been with their parents or believers. They have no idea at all about these things. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes? One of your last statements here before your conclusion, it says, uh, Ezekiel said that he does nothing without cause. Mm -hmm. yeah. This, I, I just, you know, it's been a gradual thing over the years that you see more and more of the details of yeah. how God works to where I used to think, you know, that a lot of things were just, you know, happenstance or God set everything in motion, God was overall, but I didn't see how much detail He was working out. Yeah. Like He just said, it's all because it's in the promise. It's all because if we're in His will under that promise, yeah. that promise is for us, then all of that is working together. Amen. And he's working everything specifically in our lives. I, I have no doubt that. In, in the day of judgment in the world to come, our, our ho the whole of our lives will be mm -hmm. laid out. Yeah. It, it'll produce such a shout of praise. Like when you all of a sudden you'll just you'll see how everything worked together. He tells you now it's work, he is working it together, but, but as you'll, I'm sure you're going to see it in the, in the ages to come. Oh, that the promise might yeah. be sure. Yeah, the promise might be so, sure. I mean, it, 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 if the promise isn't as sure as yeah. you're going to work on believing, because that it, it is sure, it is a sure promise. Yeah. And He's designed the kingdom in, in order that we might be sure. That's right. Oh. Isn't that something? How will I know? Well, love is sure. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When we see and we realize that our whole being has just been here to glorify God. That's right. Yes. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And then our commission is to is to get to the point where we see it. Because mm -hmm. in the strength of that vision, yeah. that's what yeah. propels you into yeah. the work of the Lord. Right. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of Oh, I'm sorry, Michelle. Go ahead, sister. I was considering whenever um Abraham did the sacrifices, how the Lord had told him, how he asked, you know, how, how will these things be? And the Lord told him to do these sacrifices, how he was persistent and diligent to not allow anything happen to the sacrifices yeah. until mm -hmm. the Lord gave him the answer to his question. Amen. 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 That's a good point. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Our Heavenly Father. We thank you for the example of Abraham and that he's our father. We thank you that we can have the faith of Abraham. Amen. And that actually Abraham 
would have been envious of us if he had known the greatness of the things you prepared for them that love you. So we thank you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.